Hallelujah. King of Kings, thank you. You may be seated. Children, you may you are dismissed. Usually they're halfway out the door already. Thank you so much, worship team. We're so blessed to have you. Thank you. Wow, hallelujah. Whew. Sometimes I have to hold on to the pulpit. I'm really excited to be with you today. I'm going to try to go slow for our translators. I have from the Chicago area, we talk loud and we talk fast. So I'm going to try to slow it down a bit. I'm really excited to share with you today what the Lord has showed me. And the title of my message is, He's Called You by Name. Amen. The real you. Amen? Amen? So I want to share a couple things with you. Um, I do have a prop. Some of you ask me, how come you don't always have props? Because if the Lord doesn't tell me to have a prop, then I'm not going to have one. Then it's just a piece of weird sitting up here. <laughs> but today, I have a friend that's going to join me on the platform. You'll see him in a minute. But this is a lesson, and I'm going to expound on it, that we have taught our children in kids' church. Now, Kelsey and I, she just went over to kids' church. We write our own curriculum for our children here. And let me tell you how and why we write what we do. We take what the enemy tried to steal from us, we flip it around, and we teach the kids and make it foundational. So I want to t tell you, every time the kids are over there, this is the prayer they pray before they get a Bible lesson. God, you are good, and you love me. You have great adventures for me every day. I receive all that you have for me. I open my heart to you today. I ask you to open my ears to hear what the Spirit is saying and my eyes to see what the Holy Spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. That's the prayer that the kids are praying. If you could just turn me down just, just slightly. That's the prayer that they're praying over there. And I started it with three words. God, you, four words. God, you are good. Why? Because it took me 30 plus years to understand that God was good. Now, your six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds are praying the prayer God, you're good. Yeah. And you have great adventures for me every day. What does that mean? We're still trying to figure that out as adults. God, do you really have good for me? Yes, He does. So, I'm going to have a friend join us on the platform today. Ian, if you could get our friend. I'm going to move this over. What does she have today? This was made for our children. And yes, I'm teaching you based on something that we taught our kids because this is what the Lord told me to do. And this is our friend today. His name is Christian. Everybody take a look at him. Say hi, Christian. And we'll put a, a chair right here. I'll hold my buddy up if you want to get me a chair. Okay, this is Christian. You want to flip that around for me? There we go. Perfect. Does everybody see my friend? Yeah. This is Christian. Let's read what it says on here. You have your mind, your will your emotions, your body. And what does this say here? Your spirit. What does it say under it? The real you. So we're going to talk about this today. And this is what our kids are learning in there. Because for most of my life, I thought the real me was what was going on in my emotions. What was going on in my mind. The things that I had been through. So the Lord had to correct some things in me to teach me who the real me was. 
See, you have three parts to you. You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. You're like, Christine, I know all this. Well, we really don't. Because we're not living in our spirit. So three years ago on Friday, my mom passed away. And I was with her when she died. I've been with several of my family members when they died. And I was in the hospital room. And she was still alive. And we were praying and I felt angels come into the room. And I knew the time was getting close. And all of a sudden, my mother took her last breath. And the real part of her stepped over into eternity like that. In an instant. It was instantaneous that my mother was with Jesus. She served the Lord for many years. I had no doubt that she was going to heaven. If you don't believe in the afterlife, I'm telling you, it's not even a question. The question is, is where will you go? The question is, is have you given your life to Jesus? Will your spirit spend eternity in hell? Or with Jesus. My mom stepped over and as I looked, all the life drained out of her body. Why? Because her spirit was gone and her body was left. This shell. The doctor said, do you want to stay here with your mom? I said, no. She's not here. And I walked out. I think he thought I was being disrespectful, but the mom, the real part of my mom was already dancing and embracing Jesus. I'm not going to sit with a sick body. My mom was already dancing. And guess what? I was a little bit jealous that she had crossed over. Granted, the enemy took her out early and he's not taking me out. I'm going to live out my destiny. And so are you. So this may look kindergarten level or trivial, but the Lord said to me that you're going to get delivered today Amen. because you're going to understand the real you and you're going to understand what the enemies tried to do to you. If you saw Miss Lily up here, she was interceding for you. Todd and Lily had something on them this morning where they were interceding and praying for you. We have an intercessory team that meets before church that prays for you, that the soil of your heart will understand what the Lord is saying today. I want to talk to you about your spirit first, the part of you that God calls by name. You are his namesake. You carry his name if you are born again. The real you. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. You look like your father. I did not know my father, but for a couple years. But I got his butt chin. When I look in the mirror, I got the dimple right in my chin. I look like my father. You look like your father. Oh, he has it too. My brother's shaking his head over there. He just, he's going like this. Of all the things, dad. Thanks. <laughs> you look like your father. The real you right in here looks like the father. Because you were made in his image. It's not just a fancy thing that was written down in Genesis. You look like your dad. Genesis 2, 7. And then God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And breathed. He breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Let me tell you something. I read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and I read it several times. He did not breathe into the animals. 
He created them. As much as you love Fluffy, Fluffy is not going to heaven. I'm sorry. You may have a cat there that God loves you so much that it looks like Fluffy, but Fluffy doesn't have the will to decide, I want Jesus. Fluffy doesn't have a spirit, but you do. It says he created animals. See, he formed man from the dust of the ground. See, he formed animals. He formed the trees. He formed the seas. He formed the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. But he went a step further for man. <sighs> he breathed the breath, his breath, the breath of life into his nostrils. It doesn't even say that a wind came by. It says... I breathe my breath into you. And your spirit was formed. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And what does it say after that? And they were both naked, the man and his wife. And they were not ashamed. There was no shame. There was no reason for shame. There was innocence. There was freedom. And then in Genesis 3, moving forward, if you've never read the creation story, or if you don't have a Bible, we will give you one today. Please see one of us. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, God, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? See, all of you are hating on Eve. You need to get over it. Because what did the enemy do? He didn't shove it in her mouth. He didn't say, eat this, lady. He had her question God's intention, which he is still doing to this day. Look how cunning the enemy is, because if he would have said to Eve, God did not say, she would have said, yes, he did. The serpent said, has God indeed said, he left room I'm telling you, this has happened to me so many times in my life. It will be 75% true and 25% just a little twisted from the enemy. That's what this is. He knew what God said. But the enemy said to her, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, she, she gave facts back. She gave exact facts. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. She knew truth. She gave it right back. But he was relentless. So first he questions God's intention, and then he lies to her. What is his name? The father of lies. Then the serpent said to the woman, because she probably, that seed that the enemy tried to plant in her mind, she probably just mm, thought about it for a second. Did he? Did he really say that? Because let me tell you something about the garden. And I saw this with my kids growing up. I have my oldest and youngest here today. You guys can have anything you want. Anything. In the kitchen. Whatever. But these cookies I made for a family that needs something. Well, why can't I have one? There is all this food. But all of a sudden I want that. Why? Because you can't have it. Just for the fact that you can't have it, you want it. 
Is that still happening today? Is he trying to paint the picture that the grass is greener on the other side? It's not. It's dead. So the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. This is a thing, okay? I don't know if animals talked in the garden. Clearly it didn't take her off guard that the snake was talking to her. So whatever, you, you have to think what you want about that. I, it, literally, if a snake started talking to me in my uh, yard, <laughs> there would, I, w- I don't shoot guns. I would have grabbed Mike's guns, <laughs> you know, just shooting all over the place. But she's having a conversation with a snake. And he says, you'll not surely die. I I wonder where it got twisted that the Father God came down and walked with him in the cool of the day, relationally, innocence, trust, vulnerability, nakedness, completely just fellowship with the Lord. But what happens we go to a lesser thing and start listening to it. Since when does Sister Susie know better than God? Since when does Brother Joe have the plan of God for your life? What is God telling you? They had it all. They're walking, husband and wife, or man and wife, whatever. They're walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In the beautiful God had given them. I love when I read Genesis. God put the animals in front of him to name. And you know what he was doing? Look what I made. Look at this this animal with this long neck. Isn't it funny? It's called a giraffe. Look at this frog and it hops and it's got a tongue. What do you want to call that, Adam? He presented the animals. He had a beautiful garden, tree after tree and good food and all. Where was the disconnect that all of a sudden we're listening to a snake? He said, surely you will not die for God knows, for God knows. The enemy will try to tell you God's intention. The enemy will try to tell you This is what God said, or this is what he didn't say. That's why you have got to read the word. You have got to read absolute truth because the enemy is feeding a lie to your mind and you don't know the truth. And so you're just like, oh, I didn't know. Like right now, some of you are really smart. And if you were like A plus X squared equals a billion, I'd be like, does it? But if you tell me God's not the healer, I would say, you are mistaken because I know the truth. But when you don't know the truth, the enemy starts coming against your mind and your emotions and feeding you a line. And what do you do? You come in agreement with it because you don't know any better. And it's not your pastor's fault. You go in and read your Bible. You dust it off and read it. So you know the truth. So the serpent says, For God knows that in that day you will eat of it and your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And you know the rest of the story. They were banished from the garden. They ate. She gave it to him and he blamed her and we're still doing that now. Take ownership. You are the only one responsible for your Christian walk. I was thinking about this this morning. No, yes, I was. I have some dog stories, some husky stories. I was was taking the dog out this morning. I'll tell you the story later on why I had to walk the dog when we have a fence. I'll tell you that story later. But I had Caitlin's Crocs on. Anybody know what Crocs are? Hideous shoes that came back. I mean, they're like tires on the feet. (laughs) I had her Crocs on, and I don't even know what else, and I'm half asleep, and I'm walking this dog. 
and she's sniffing everything and having a great time, and I'm trying not to get there. So I'm just praying in the spirit. And this dog has not gone to the bathroom for like 16 hours. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but what? I could not make this dog go to the bathroom. And I'm walking her, and I'm why? And I'm like, and all, all I could think of was Christians. You can give them and give them everything they need, but we can't make you read your Bible. We can't make you have relationship with the Lord. So we know sin entered and they were banished from the garden. But thank God for the plan of redemption. And just in case somebody's told you different, God didn't hurry up quick, come with a plan. Oh no, man fell. Because the Bible says Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. The plan was in place before the mistake was made. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go back. You were born. You were born? Everybody was born. Okay. You were born a sinner in need of a savior. Tuck your toes in. Tuck them in. You got boots on? You are not saved by baptism. I'm I'm telling you. You are not saved by being sprinkled. You are not saved by being dunked as a baby or dunked as an adult. You are saved by Jesus Christ, the one and true living God that laid his life down for you. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You have to choose. You have to choose. Your spirit, the real you, is longing for connection to God. Because he created you. Your spirit longs for its maker. When I understood, if I make something, excuse me, I made a big pot of chili last night. Brisket chili I made. It's really good. (laughs) I know everything about it. Ask me right now. I'll give you everything in it. Because I made it. He knows everything about you. He's the one that breathed you in your mother's womb. So lest you think you're hiding from him, he made you. And he knows everything about you. Creation was very personal. God intricately created and formed the animals. All for man. That's why I love to go to the mountains, and I'm annoyed when buildings go up on empty places. What's this road out here? Is this uh, 29? No, 49, 29? On the way here? Oh, and now there's a big factory there. I wanted to see the cows when I drove by. Even the world, where do they go? They want to see. I, I, Mike and I were on Grandfather Mountain recently. Um, I used to not be, I'm not really afraid of heights. I'm just scared. (laughs) Um, We were at Grandfather Mountain. There's the Mile High Bridge up there. And I had a hold of Mike, like, fierce. Um, Because it was a little rickety, actually. And it was windy. But people are flocking to see something not made by man. They're flocking to the ocean. They're flocking to uh, the mountains, to the wonders of the world. Why? Because God made them even if they don't know it. They want to see something beautiful. But he intricately created and formed animals. And God said it was very good. And he presented it to man. He enjoyed He was creative. I know he enjoyed, there's some goofy looking animals out there. He was stretching and pulling and, you know, whatever he did on that day, or maybe he just thought it all came. That's probably what happened. But some of these goofy animals, just to what? Give us pleasure. 
I love to go to zoos. I love to see animals. I love to see creation. Because I know they were created by the maker. Like I said, he made, created, and formed animals, but he breathed into man. When it came to man, he made them in our li- his likeness. Animals are not made in his likeness. Yahweh breathed his breath and put Adam's spirit in his body. And then he walked with him and fellowshiped with him. See, all our Christian walk is what? We're longing for the garden. We're longing for intimacy. We're longing for that in the brokenness of the world. On the inside here, your spirit can connect in fellowship with its maker. This morning, I'm laying in bed and I'm calling it, you are faithful. You are the faithful one as we are like, in so many words, walking in the garden together. Oh, Chrissy, well, you don't have any problems. You have no idea. But let me tell you something. This is what I'm going to connect to. I'm going to connect my spirit because the spirit of God lives within me. Complete and tonal vulnerability. No shame, just relationship. Just enjoyment. I don't know who said this. If you know, somebody tell me. The chief end of man is what? Anybody know that quote? To glorify God or love God and enjoy him forever. What is that? That's walking with him in the cool of the day. That's walking with him all day. That's being connected to him. See, the snake comes in and questions, or the enemy comes in and questions God. It makes us double-minded. What does double-minded mean? It means your spirit, your spirit's trying to talk to you. Christine, God's good. And what does he do? He comes in in your mind and he says, why did God let you down? In my spirit, my spirit, because I'm not being quiet and I'm not having intimacy with him, I can't even hear And my mind is screaming at me, where's your God now? Why are you sick? I thought he was the healer. You think the enemy doesn't know scripture? All you have to do is read the temptation of Christ. The enemy was quoting the word at Jesus. Some, you understand the enemy knows the word more than you and I do. Because you know why he has to know the word? So he can twist it. She had no reason to doubt the goodness of God. Why? She lived in paradise. Then he questions God's intention. And then this made me so sad. I don't know how long that was that they were in the garden. It doesn't specify that. But this is what Adam says. God says, where are you? Listen to the words of Adam. I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked, and I hid myself. All that time, he's talking and having fellowship. And when the enemy came in, what does he say? Now I feel scared of you. We're still dealing with the same stuff thousands of years later. Same game. Same game the enemy's trying to do. See, God's voice had always been relational and good. They were not meant to know the evil part just the good part okay but we fell and then there was redemption but do you see are you starting to understand that the enemy is still playing the same games with you how many times has the enemy questioned God's heart and intention towards you 
or your situation. Then we end up walking same as Adam and Eve did in fear and shame and hiding. Because our spirit is longing for the garden, longing for vulnerability with the Father. Our spirit is longing to have complete trust in our walk with God and intimacy. The real you is your spirit that the Father breathed into you in your mother's womb. John 1, 13. This verse changed my life. You who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What does that mean? That verse means that clearly you had a mother and father somewhere along the way, even if you didn't know them. But you, the real you, is not of blood nor the will of the flesh. What does that mean? Think about it. Not because two people got together. Not because a man and a woman had a one-night stand. Not because somebody had an affair. It's because you were supposed to be here. This verse proves it right here. John 1.13, if you ever question if you're supposed to be here. Well, I came into the world in such a bad way. You have to understand that your spirit was breathed in your mother's womb. And that verse said, no matter how you got here, even if you weren't wanted, even if you were given up, your maker wanted you. And you are supposed to be here at this time in this season of life. You entered this world by a man and a woman. No matter how you got here, God has a call and plan for your life. See, this was so undeveloped in me. It was so broken. There, there is probably only a few of you that I know that had a godly mother and father. A few. When my kids were in school, in a classroom of 23 or 24, at times, my children were the only one that had two parents. So what happens? I'm, I'm seven, eight, nine years old with a deficit in my emotions. There was a big hole in my life. All through my life, it was undeveloped. Because I didn't have that mother or that uh, daughter-father relationship, which is vitally important. I remember when I was in high school, they said, what do you want to be? What path do you want to go on? Blank. I had no aspirations in life. Why? I didn't really have any development in that area. My kids, like literally, uh, my husband will talk to my kids. They'll be like, I want to, Caitlin said, I want to open a dog cafe. Cool, how can I help? Let's do it. Have coffee, have your dog there, have treats, all this kind of stuff. She started crocheting recently, and, and we went and bought $50 worth of yarn. And see how you, you get this creative idea. The Lord starts speaking to your spirit. And you have this little cultivated idea, this little ember. What is mom and dad supposed to do? <sighs> Breathe on that. But what if you don't have it? You have these little embers. And the enemy comes in, in your emotions, in your mind, in your will. And he starts bringing trauma. From a very young age, because I already had a deficit, as many of you did. The enemy had a field day with me. He came in in my emotions. He came in in my mind. As many of you know, I dealt with a lot of mental torment. Because the deceiver came in in my life. Even though I was raised in a Christian home by my mom, the enemy, kept, he, he just, he had a field day with the trauma. 
I was very broken as a child. My brother knows we dealt with a lot of brokenness. And then what do you do? Then you try to cope. How do I cope? I can't seem to connect with God, but see, I was born again. I loved God with all my heart. But because I was living here, I could not hear the truth of the Father. And the enemy sabotaged me because on a daily basis, if anybody's dealt with mind issues, it was constant 24-7 against my mind. It was screaming so loud at me that, let me tell you something, the Father is always speaking to you. Always. All the time. Every day. And in the night. There's no time with the... In, in the spirit realm. The Bible says he sings songs of deliverance over you. He's singing over you when you're sleeping. So it's not that all those years that the Lord wasn't talking to me, it's that my mind was screaming and I could not hear. My emotions, where are you, God? Screaming out of abandonment. I couldn't connect to the real me because the truth had gotten so twisted. See, I knew the scripture, but the scripture was not part of me. I could quote it. We went to Baptist school. Baptists can quote scripture. They beat it into us, man, and I'm glad they did. I love you, Baptists. We, we had to memorize chapters, not verses, chapters, right, Carl? Chapters. And because I didn't know truth, I was living here. I was living in my emotions. And I went for years, I went for years trying to understand who God was through the lens of what I had been through. I felt like half a person. Anybody else ever feel like half a person or undeveloped? That is why. And I told myself, it tormented me. I will never be whole because I had a bad start. It really bothered me. And I remember telling the Lord, what is it just, oh well, until you get to heaven? I said, there's got to be a better way. I can't, you, your son didn't die on the cross so I could live half my whole life and undeveloped. And I remember I cried out to God and I cried out to God and I said, I am not leaving here. It's, it's like a, I don't know if I was threatening the Lord. I'm not leaving here. The Lord's like, yeah, in five minutes, you're going to want a snack. But I was like, I'm not leaving here until you tell me. I said, I have to know because I had to know because I teach others. I said, I cannot go into that healing room and I cannot tell somebody that has had a broken childhood that God can heal you and make you whole, even without the, parent, the parental needs that you had that you didn't have. I was like, you tell me if it's possible. And I cried out to God, and I cried out to God, and I said, you tell me. And this is what he said to me. Your earthly father did not write your story. I did. And I got completely delivered that day. Because let me tell you what an earthly father is supposed to do. This is the plan of God, that the father and the mother, but especially the father. Why do we live in a fatherless generation? It's a plan of the enemy. This is what the father is supposed to do. He helps their children get born again. And then what he does is he takes what the father God has breathed into that child and he cultivates and he cultivates and he teaches about father God. You didn't write your kid's story. Yeah, you may have messed him up in the natural, but God can fix it. We've all been dumb. We've all 
haven't been perfect, and we told our kids that. I've apologized to my kids more times than I can count. I will never put off that thing that I'm perfect. That's a long way to fall. There's times I would get into my emotions or feelings or whatever with, with my kids, and I'd, you know, I'd, I'd yell at them. And because my spirit was in line with God, I would go in my room, these kids, and, and I'm having a fit with the Lord. And the Lord says to me, go apologize. <laughs> Did you not hear what they said to me? Were you not listening? Go apologize. And then I would stay there a minute, and he would say, let me tell you what's going on in their life. And then I would end up apologizing and ministering to our children. The Lord said that you went through this today. Tears running down their face. Because what? We just brought the Father to them. And then you show your kids how to hear from the Lord. Because you're not that great. Sorry. <laughs> we try. But if you can get them to hear from the Lord. Amen. We would send our kids in, which my mom did to us. Go in your room and come out when the Father speaks to you. Oh, God, please. Call, talk quick. <laughs> please. It's almost dinner time. <laughs> please. <laughs> my kids admitted to me years later. This is really funny. I used to send them in their room to pray together when they would fight. What did you guys say? <laughs> Becca would pray and say, quick, what does mom want to hear? <laughs> 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 they admitted that to me years later. <laughs> How can we move along with this? But you have to teach your kids the father's voice. Because I'm going to tell you as a parent, you will disappoint your children. Amen. You will. But the Father won't. Amen. The Father won't. Amen. If you tell your kids, you know what, mom was in a bad mood, but Father God is never in a bad mood. Amen. That is the absolute truth. As I said, the earthly father, your earthly father, your earthly mother did not write your story. Father God did, as it says in Psalm 139, it's so beautiful. You, God, formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside. What does that mean? My body and my spirit and my soul. And wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. I want you to understand, some of you, the Lord told me, are feeling very numb. You can't tap into creativity. You don't know what you like and don't like. It's because you haven't connected your spirit with the Father to have him tell you who you really are. I got a notebook, and I wrote on there my journey. Because I'm going to be very transparent with you. My life had been about rescuing people up to the point I was probably in my 30s. Because my dad died and then my mom was dying when I was 10 or 11, I, something clicked over in me. Now you have to save people. So the, the spirit part that was connected to the Father, and which is the real me, when people would ask me, what do you want? I didn't even know what I wanted to eat at times. What's your favorite color? I would actually make things up. When I was in high school, they said, what do you want to be? And so I made up an accountant. <laughs> which is hilarious because I've done accounting later in life. <laughs> I just, I was like, what do you want to hear? They're like, just pick a, you know, the counselor sitting there. She's got like eight minutes with every student or three minutes. They're like, what do you want to do and how can I help you? I'm broken. I don't know. So I made it up so they would get off my back. 
And then the army was interested in me. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> That's true. Carl knows. Carl almost joined the army. Can you imagine me in the army? Oh my gosh, I'd get kicked out. On the way to boot camp, it's too hot in here. I can't take it. I have to carry what? I'm 5'3". I can't, I can't carry this thing. It was because I was good at math and one of the tests we took and all that goofy stuff. But, but I, had to, I had to imagine something because I didn't know that I was made mysteriously complex. It says, everything you do, Lord, is marvelously breathtaking. He doesn't make junk. The things that you feel about your own life are the things that have happened to you. The things in here where you feel broken and traumatized. The things that you're carrying in your life are the things that have been done to you and possibly things that you have done. David said, it simply amazes me to think about it, how thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me beautifully. I love this. When you created me in the secret place. Listen to that. Not when you were created in a hotel room or in the back of a car. You were created in the secret place. Amen. Carefully, skillfully, you shaped me from nothing to something. You saw who created me to be before I came to be. Books and books are written about you in heaven on who you really are and the plan of God for your life. Before I'd even seen the light of day. Do you understand that? Before you were born, he had a great plan for you. And he still does. The number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. See, there's books about you in heaven with amazing things that God has for you. And I, and I have I've pondered this over the years. I've said, can I look? <laughs> How am I supposed to know? Can I look? There's been times in my life, and I said this a couple days, or when I spoke last time, that the Lord told me, if I told you things, you would have disqualified yourself. So right now, we're going to go a sentence at a time. Because that's what you can handle. Because there's things right now that I'm doing in my life that I would have said, mm, I'm good. Mm, that's too hard. Mm, I don't really like talking in front of people. I'm good one-on-one. -on -one. But see, because I was made so mysteriously complex, even when I was in high school, I was ministering to the ladies at 14, 15, 16 years old. I didn't even know that I was walking in my calling because I had given my life over to God. And the Lord was like, oh, you just wait. That's why it's so important for you to be faithful where you're at. If you will be faithful with who's in front of you, all of a sudden the Lord says, you pass that. Let's go to the next thing. But some of you won't even talk to the person sitting next to you. And they're like, how is your day? And you're like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Or the Lord says, I just want you to draw or paint or make cookies for that person. You're like, but what if they don't like my cookies? And you're disqualifying yourself. And the Lord's trying to bring you into the things that he's called you to do. And you're so busy here and here and even in your will. I just got to keep climbing. I just got to provide for my family, which you do. Don't be a bum. You got you to gotta provide for your family. But what happens is it clicks over 
where you haven't asked the Lord, what's the plan of God for our family? What have you called me to? What have you called me and my wife to? So your will takes over. I got to have this house. I got to have this number of kids. I got to have this car. I have to have this business. And you have not even asked the Lord what his plan was for you. Because I can promise you it will be greater than anything that you can even imagine. The enemy hates seeing God inside of you. He hates when he looks at you and you are connected with the Holy Spirit and your spirit is lit up. It's blinding to him. What does he want to look at? He wants to look at something that he thinks he did to you. He wants to look at damaged emotions. He wants to look at the fact that he set up for you to be molested when you were young. He wants to look at the fact of things that he tried to do to you to to make you feel broken. What he doesn't understand is when you're connected and your spirit is alive and this starts seeping into your emotions and it starts seeping into your mind and all of a sudden your whole body is transformed and your mind is transformed and he can't even look at you because you look so much like Jesus. So he's going to work really, really, really hard to keep you here, to keep you in your mind. To keep you in your soul. See, this is who God sees when he looks at you. When God looks at you, he sees what he created. You think he looks at you and he sees that thing you did or that thing you didn't do. When he looks at you, he sees this. Some of you, if you will just grab onto that. That my maker, my father God, when he looks at me, he sees what he created. See, some of you are so hard on yourselves, which was me. I didn't do this. I should have done that. And that's what, for some reason, I had it figured out how the ultimate creator of the universe saw me. Because I'm so smart. Well, when he sees me, So what do we do? We go back to what happened in the garden and we hide ourselves. We live in shame. And the father's like, oh, Christine, there is no case against you. The enemy is the one that's lying to your mind. When I see you, Christine, I see the one I created. I see the beautiful thing, the intricate, the mysteriously complex. And when I understood that, and when I meditated on that, my whole life changed. You are your worst critic. You are sabotaging yourself. Because you don't think that somebody would see you and not see your past. Because I'm going to tell you, people are not good at that. But if the Bible is really true, your sin is thrown as far as the east is from the west. So you either grab a hold of that or you don't. Because when you look at you, what are you looking at? Are you looking at how damaged you are? Are you looking at things in your will that you did or didn't do? Are you looking at the torment in your mind and the thoughts and the things that you've done? What are you looking at? For many of you, which it did to me, it had become my identity. Things that I did or didn't do. I constantly felt like I fell short. And then I could talk to you all day about even the body. I could talk to you about the body. When you're battling any type of sickness, don't worry, I can preach through it. Don't worry about it. Doesn't bother me. Don't let it bother you. I have battled illness since I was uh, seven, eight years old. 
and I'm about to be 45. It's been a very difficult road. But I'm going to tell you something. Because my spirit latched on to the fact that he's a healer, what I was going through in my body never became my identity. I'm going to tell you there's times, and I spoke on this a couple weeks ago, that I would be doubled over and there would be a demon right here. The spirit of death would be in my room. Spirit of infirmity where I felt bowed over and I would stand up straight and I would say, you are my healer. You are my healer. Sometimes, and my kids can tell you this, I could barely take one step in front of the other, but it never became my identity because my spirit latched a hold of, he is the healer. I would never let the enemy come into my mind and say, oh, but aren't you still sick? That's enough. Be quiet. What does the Bible say about your thought life? You got to take it captive. I'm telling you, we have an officer here. I don't know if he's in the building or not. When they take somebody captive, they're not doing this. What are they doing? You better get your hands behind your back. And they put those cuffs on them and they put them in the car. That's what you have to do. If your body is screaming at you, you wash your face and you say, he is the healer. I will still read my Bible. I will still do what God's called me to do if I have to crawl there. Don't you dare tell me it's easy for you to say because it's not, because I have crawled places almost. And then what happens a lot with when you deal with physical stuff, it gets into your emotions. You have to see the plan of the enemy. He'll battle you or he'll uh, try to... uh, you know, with sickness and things like that, then it makes you feel emotional. God, I can't do this. And then what happens? Depression starts coming in. And then what happens? And then all of a sudden your mind, the devil starts lying to you. What does he say? Why don't you just leave this place? You're too sick. You're too broken. Nobody loves you. So he can get you out of this world. So now the enemy's got all these places that he's trying to come in. I'm telling you, if your spirit belongs to God, you cannot be possessed of the devil. You can be oppressed, but he doesn't own you. You always have a way because you gave your spirit over. So even at your worst, you have, feeling your worst, you have to sit down and say, God, I feel so broken. My mind's messed up. My emotions are messed up. My will's messed up. My body's broken. But I'm going to read the word, and I'm going to pray in the spirit, and I'm going to focus on absolute truth because this is what happens. I'm going to tell you, most of my life, most of my life, I lived in about 25% here. 75% was living in my mind and emotions. I'm just being real with you. I think that's what you want me to do. And I remember what I did is I laid my thought life before the Lord. And I imagined it as a table. And I laid it down and I said, Holy Spirit, your name is Spirit of Truth. And I laid it all out, and I said, what is you and what is not you? And I'm telling you, 75% of it, 75% of my thought life did not come in agreement with what the Word says. And you're like, wow, that's really bad. Well, it was in my emotions too, so, yeah. 75%. The Lord said to me, 75% of what your emotions are thinking about me is not true. Because I was trying to see God through the pain of abandonment. So what did I do? I laid my emotions before the Lord. And I said, what is you and what is not you? And for months and months, he brought correction to me. 
and I would study the scripture and he would say, do you see how you feel like I'm not here? Do you see how you feel abandoned when things happen in your life? Let me show you truth. The word says, I will never leave you or forsake you because you're engraved on the palm of my hand. It's your choice whether you're going to believe it or not. And this is the hang up, but I don't feel it. This is not the real you, whether you feel it or not. Jesus died on the cross. Whether you feel it or not, you're forgiven. Whether you feel it or not, he's the healer. Whether you feel it or not, he's the deliverer. The enemy wants to come in with trauma starting from a young age, especially before you're born again. It's like a double whammy. So he can try to have access to areas inside of you. As I said, it's vitally important to teach your children as young as possible. And to get them born again. To understand the cross and Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Well, they don't understand until they're older. That's not true. My children were probably around six or seven when they gave their lives to the Lord. Because we sat them down and we explained the why. Teach them about the goodness of God and the love of God. Because the world, the world is evil. And it's trying to, everything on social media and all this stuff, it's trying to pull the other way. And if you don't get kids at a young age, they're going to get swept away in the river of the world. Is it hard to raise kids right now? Absolutely. But I wouldn't trade it. And this is what Mike and I did. We turned around and we walked against the flow. This is how my children are going to be. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we're crying out to God. And we're walking. And we're beat up. And we're fighting for our children. And you fight for your kids. And you fight for your grandkids. You fight for your marriage. Well, it's hard. It is. But greater is he that lives in you than he that is in this world. You're not fighting this battle alone. Growing up without a dad, my mom used to say, go talk to your dad. I ain't got no money. She was talking about Father God. She said, I have no money for you. She said, go in your room and talk to your father. I said, okay. So I would go and literally be like, God, I need a pair of shoes every single time. I'm telling you, somebody would show up at my mom's door and be like, I don't know, the Lord told me to give you this bag of shoes. That happened all the time because you know why? I knew he was my dad. I may not have had one here, but I knew he was my father. The enemy wants you to identify with these other areas. Your soul, your mind, will, and emotions. Your, emo- the, your soul is a combination of your mind, your mind, what you've perceived, what you've learned, what you've seen. Some of you have seen terrible things, and you can't get those things out of your head. But the Father wants to come in and heal those things for you. I'm just going to tell you, I would not be up here, and I would not take people through healing if God had not made me whole. Because if I don't believe it, I would never try to tell you who he is. He has made me absolutely whole in my life. I can't even tell you how many things I've been delivered from. He has healed me. He has set me free. Where I am not living that my mind and my thoughts are my reality or my emotions are my reality. Your emotions are up one day and down the next and sideways and in the toilet and today I feel good and I ate a cookie and now I feel, come on. Your emotions aren't truth. Your emotions are things, let me tell you what this is supposed to be. Your emotions were given to you to enjoy the world. Not the world, you know what I mean. To enjoy, to laugh, to love the fruit of the Spirit. 
peace, joy, to experience the things. that God gave you emotions. God gave you a mind to be educated, to be smart, and to think about things and to process things. He gave you a will, a free will to choose. What a beautiful thing. God didn't say, I'm created you, creating you, now you do this. What a, what a, what's the word I'm looking for? Can't think of the word right now. Where he, um, where he gave the power to choose. He, he knows, I believe he knows what's going to happen. But there's no, you're going to go to hell and you're going to go to heaven. What's written in your book is that you belong to God and that you choose to serve and love him and follow him. How hard that must be to create something and to know that they have the option to not even connect to you. See, none of these other things are absolute truth. Your spirit connected to the Holy Spirit shows the absolute truth of the Father. The thing is, is that it feels like truth because you're going through it and you're experiencing it. You have to understand that the Lord knows how hard this life is. He knows the world is broken. He knows the struggle. He knows the struggle is real. I would never, ever lie to you and say that it's not difficult. Why? Because the world is broken. But you don't have to be broken. So I want to tell you a quick story. I'm going to try to, I need to hurry. So I want to show you a bit about the brokenness of the world, but how the Father is so good. So was that yesterday, Caitlin? Okay. Another story about the Husky. She seems on the front lines for helping me minister lately. So I went to go. I had to have blood work for something, and then I went to go meet with somebody. So I was leaving my house, which I, I lived 30 minutes from where I was going to go. Caitlin's old enough to stay home alone. And so I got in my car, and I had been praying in the Spirit a lot. If you're not filled with the Spirit, with uh, the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, it's the only way I make it in this world. I'm just telling you. Praying in the Spirit. So I had been praying in the Spirit a lot that morning, and I got in the car. And the day before, our cell phones weren't working very well. They were not connecting. We live in a more rural area. And I got in the car, and the Lord said, go reset the Internet. And I went to shut my door, and I was like, is that, like, reset the Internet? And it waved over me. What if Caitlin couldn't get a hold of you? So I was like, yeah, okay. So I went and reset it and went on my way. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting at Panera ready to meet with somebody, and Caitlin calls me. <gasps> what? What happened? The dog got out. She picked up the fence and crawled under it. And she's gone. You have to understand a husky. Once they're gone, they're not coming back. They're free. Their goal is to be free. They love you, but they also want to be free. So I text a couple friends, and I said, I need you to pray. The dog got out. I'm 30 minutes away. There's, and I said, don't leave the house. And I said, Lord, we dispatch your angels. Go and get my dog. <laughs> so I'm driving home, and I'm praying in the spirit. And I'm not yielding to my emotions. I'm not yielding to the thoughts. Because as soon as I did that, I, I, all I could see was my dog dead on the side of the road. And I was like, no. You either believe God's going to help you or you don't. So I stopped. I, I, I said, no. you got to push it away. and you got to say, we're not doing that. I'm not feeling that right now. I'm not thinking that way. So I prayed in the spirit. So I got in the driveway, or, or I got close to the house, and Caitlin calls me. 
she ran by the house. I opened a car door and she got in. <laughs> I said, what? All I could think of is she could be in Concord by now. I live way up. I live 30 minutes from here. And I said, I, I just started thanking the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So I got in the driveway and I threw my arms around Caitlin. And she's sitting there with the dog that's, <laughs> she, I mean, she had a great time. And I, I mean, of course, my soul wanted to smack her. And I'm like, you're home, you know. And all of a sudden, the Lord peeled the curtain back. And this is what the Lord said to me. Let me tell you what the plan of the enemy was today. Today, or that day, was the day my mom died three years ago. The plan of the enemy was that my daughter would be home alone and have nobody to call. It was a trauma point. But God. You have to understand there's all these things set up by the enemy. What does Psalm 91 say? All this stuff, the arrow flying by day, you know, you're dodging stuff like this. It's not going to stop flying. The arrows are not going to stop. But because I was still, and because you can be still, and the Lord says, hey, listen, reset your internet. So when I got back to the house, that trauma did not happen. And we held hands, and we thanked the Lord that Father God cared enough to bring our doggy home. You have to see that the enemy has plans, but God's plans are so much greater. The Holy Spirit told me one day, life is not supposed to be as hard as it is for you. I said, whoa, why? He said, because I want to talk to you. I want to say, don't go that way. Don't do that. Plug the internet in. Do this. Don't do this. Because I want to save you from what the world and the enemy is trying to do. That's the goodness of God. And I told my daughter, I said, let me tell you how much your father loves you. That he saved you today from a trauma point in your life. How evil is it that the devil tried, he took my mom out on that day and tried to make it seem like her own mother wasn't there. Do you see how evil that is? But God. And that can happen to you all the time. That's what Psalm 91 says. You staying connected to the Holy Spirit. You telling your mind, we're not, mm -mm, we're not doing that. We're not thinking that way because this is what the Bible says, that I will never leave you or forsake you. I will, uh, you were tattooed on my hand. If you make him your dwelling place. See, your soul wants to bend to the things of the world to temporarily fix or numb the pain. I'm telling you, it doesn't work. It might temporarily make you feel good for a minute. But until you get deliverance from the Lord, all of this will be temporary. All of the temporary things of the world will make you feel good for a minute, and then the enemy will come in and make you feel bad and shame for it. That's the goal. Shame is the goal. Psalm 139, again. Janet, if you would come up for me, please. I'm going to tell you, friends, how do you do this? Because this is the real you, and because of everything the enemy has tried to do to you over the years. You lay your emotions before the Lord. And when I say that, I'm talking about the, the part of you that has tried to hide from him all these years. The pain, the pain that nobody knows. I remember crying and crying tears. I have journals, journals full of tear-stained pages. God, I felt like you weren't there for me. My spirit knows that you were, but I can't feel you. Help me. Help my emotions. Help my mind where I have a bend that goes to a disappointment. And I have thoughts come in. 
Help my will. Help me to turn my will over to you and give you control. If you've dealt with any control or manipulation in your life, this will be the hardest thing you ever do. Turning your will over to someone that doesn't want to control or manipulate you. That's what the world wants. His intentions are good for you. You can turn your will over to him and you can say, God, I want you to have control over every area in my life. My mind, my will, my emotions, and my body. The Bible says that you have to renew your mind. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. What's the pattern of this world? It's a mess. It's broken. It's a mess. You know, even, even sexuality is a mess. There's purity in that. There's purity. See, there's so, like even marriages now. Even Christian couples are, are having sex before they're married and all that. It, it's just all broken because, see, there's purity that's been lost. There's innocence that's been lost. You have to be transformed. Your mind has to be transformed. Your emotions, your will, your body, all has to be transformed. How? You have to renew your mind with the word. Well, I have a hard time reading the Bible. No, duh. Why? The enemy doesn't want you to know the truth. <laughs> well, I don't understand the Old Testament. Then read the New Testament. Give me an excuse. Listen to an audio. I'm not a good reader. Then listen to it. We live in 2024. Somebody can read you the Bible. <laughs> Get it in you. I play it when I'm driving or when I put my makeup on in the morning. Just get it in you. Get truth inside of you. And then you lay all these areas down before the Lord. This is what Psalm 139 says. You know everything there is to know about me. And what does that mean? Listen to this. You perceive every movement of my heart and my soul. See, we take that negatively. I want to hide all this. Everything changed for me when I got back to the vulnerability and I said, I am a mess. And the Lord said, I know, but I can fix it. I laid on my floor and I said, God, I'm a hot mess. And the Lord would say, tell me, why? When you, and I was talking to somebody about this the other day, when you verbally talk to the Lord, even if you can't verbally do it, write it in a journal. It validates what you've been through. When you say, God, they hurt me when I was young. They abused me. And you're like, God already knows. When you say it to him, you understand it's coming out of your mouth. And you know the great counselor is listening. And he cares about you. You understand every thought before it enters my mind. See, I used to take that so negatively. Oh, I got to hide my thoughts. I would, now I'm like, whoa, Lord, what is this? <laughs> Where did that come from? And I lay it before him, and then he starts talking to me, just cast it away. Or the enemy's trying to do this. Or you're thinking this way because of this. See, it used to take me forever. I'd be dwelling on something for days. Now it's a split second. Because you know why? The Holy Spirit has trained my mind. Literally, I almost will hear my mind say, Oh, you don't know we don't do that here. She don't think like that. My emotions will be like, whoa, you don't understand. She's been praying for two hours this morning. <laughs> you picked the wrong day to tell her that because you are out of here. You read my heart 
You're so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book. You know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. I want you to shut your eyes as I read the rest of this, please. You know every step. He knows every step you'll take before your journey even began. Ma'am, sir, I've gone into your future to prepare a way. And in kindness, I follow behind you to spare you from the harm of your past. I've laid my hand upon you. Where can you go from my spirit? And where can you run and hide your face? If you go up to heaven, I'm there. That means if you're doing great, I'm there. If you go down to the realm of the dead, I am there too. If you fly on the wings into the shining dawn, I'm there. Wherever you go, my hand will guide you to strengthen and empower you. It is impossible for you to disappear from him or to ask the darkness to hide you. For your presence is everywhere, God, bringing light into my night. He knows what you've been through, and he wants to heal your wounds. This is the key that the Lord told me. Just keep your eyes closed, please, as I minister these words. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So today, you're going to invite him into your mind. You're going to invite him into your emotions, into your will, into every part of you that you may have hidden from him. And then you start walking transformed. This is what the enemy does not want. A whole person. Your spirit starts calling the shots. And there is so much freedom, authority, and dominion here. The light inside of you will start blinding the enemy. Ma'am, sir, son, daughter, teenager, child. He's calling you by name today. He's calling out to the person that he created. Even if you feel stuck, he's calling you out today by name. He's calling to you that today he wants to heal you from the harm of your past. And that he's preparing a, he has already prepared a good future for you. The Lord told me today... He's restoring innocence. Some of you had your innocence stolen and it's come into every area of your life, your body, your emotions, and your mind. Even your will was broken when you were young by things that happened. He's going to come in today and heal you. Isaiah 43, 1 says, I formed you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Will you stand with me as we pray? Will you just pray in the spirit if you have your prayer language right now? God's about to do something in this place right now. He already has, but you're about to be delivered. your spirit rise up within you I want you to talk to him right now tell the Lord I need help my mind needs help my emotions need help my will needs help if this has spoken to you right now I want you to take a step and come to the altar right now you're about to get delivered Run to this altar right now if this spoke to you.
If you need freedom in any of these areas, oh, the Father's about to come in. The Spirit of God is about to come all over you right now. Jesus. Don't hold back. I'm telling you, there's something about taking a step forward. You're telling God, I need help. I need you. I want our pastoral leadership to join me on the platform. Put your hands towards these people today. We're praying for you. Oh. Oh, Deep calls unto deep. The Spirit of God inside of you to illuminate, to illuminate. I want you to lift your hands to him right now. Say, God, I need you. Your son paid it all. Lay your hand on your mind right now. Say, I invite you into my mind. Put your hand right here and say, I invite you into my emotions. Say, I invite you into my will. Transform me. I will put the work in. I will renew my mind. I will connect to the Holy Spirit. Oh, I pray deliverance over you today. I thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is coming to heal you from the harm of your past. Ma'am, the Lord is all over you right now. I thank you, Lord. Oh, you just need to let it out. You need to let it out, sister. Oh, just tell him. Just tell him. What do you want him to heal you from? What do you want him to heal you from? Just tell him. Oh, come in, Lord. Jesus. Come in. Shira baso, baso koto. Oh, there's such a holy atmosphere up here right now. If you need to come up, I want you to stand here. Oh, the Holy Spirit is doing a new thing up here. Don't be embarrassed. Sing, I need you more. Oh, Nabasho. If you have to leave, I want you to leave quietly. We're going to lay hands on those here.
Just sing that to him. I need you. Yes, we do, Lord. Every day. Every day, Lord. More than the air I breathe. you will continue with what the Lord has showed you today and the enemy will not steal the seed that was planted inside of you. I thank you Lord for transformation in the mighty and holy name of Jesus. Oh we love you Jesus. We love you Lord. Hallelujah. Janet's going to play. Hug somebody as you go out. Thank you for being here. We'll see you Wednesday night. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.